Hello and welcome to Changemakers. In the show, we have interesting conversations with people who are making a change, making a difference, making an impact. Our guest today is Buzz Alexander, professor of English literature at the University of Michigan, winner of the Carnegie Case National Award for Teaching in 2005, founder of the Prison Creative Arts Project, and the author of the book is William Martinez, Not Our Brother. Professor Alexander, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So when I read the book, the first thing that struck me is prison and creative arts. Those are not the two things that comes together in most people's mind. And so how did this all originate, and uh, uh, why have you stuck with it for so long? Good questions. Uh, the, uh, it, it, I was teaching a course at the University of Michigan on guerrilla theater. So we were going out into the streets or going into classrooms and being disruptive around social justice issues. And there was a student who was, uh, wanted, was taking the course in 1990, uh, in January, and she was actually delivering materials to two women who were enrolled at the University of Michigan from prison. So she was driving an hour and a half and an hour and a half back to bring them the materials. And it turned out that they wanted to take this course, the guerrilla theater course. And uh, I said yes, I was very eager for this, and uh, started going out every week with that student and another student, and we met in a little, what was called a muster room, where the officers mustered before they went in uh, for their shift change. And it was also a room with um, a mural of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, uh, Dwarves, because it was also where the children were brought to meet with their mothers. So it was a very interesting and important place, I think. And so we went out, and uh, we did theater exercises. Uh, we learned a lot about prison. I had not known anything about it uh, virtually uh, before that. And um, at one point, I brought in an exercise that I'd actually used in a shanty town uh, down in Peru, in the, a shanty town named Huaycan. And the exercise basically is I came in, and I asked the two women uh, to sit down and spend 20 minutes writing down questions mm -hmm. that they had for us. And uh, the obvious question uh, that happened both in the shanty town and here, the first question was, what are you doing here? Why are you coming here? Yeah. And are, are you, uh, quote, interested in prisons? Are you studying us? Are you writing papers about us? And, and so on. Uh, and we had to answer that honestly. Uh, they were going to be very alert to our lying or pretending things and so on. So we had to find inside of ourselves what we had to say. Yeah. And then they put us through some situations that they had faced in prison. For instance, I was asked if I had recently come to prison and uh, some, somebody stole something of mine, what would I do? Yeah. And I think I gave the wrong answer. I said I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't report, at least I knew I wouldn't report them. Yeah. Uh, but I think the right answer was I would have to uh, stand up to them and, and uh, challenge them uh, to get the thing back. Otherwise, my reputation would be uh, a weak one in the prison. So we did that. We answered the questions. And then they, uh, uh, one of them turned to the other, and she said, we need to open this to the whole prison. Yeah. And um, that was a very powerful moment. And uh, so they appealed to the warden, who was exactly the right warden. She approved of it. Uh, 120 women signed up for the workshop. That's incredible. Uh, 60 came uh, to the, to the uh, first workshop. They, they stood in a circle, which is all I told them to do, and they held hands. And for me, that's always meant that somehow they had understood there was something special about this space and about what we were going to do. Yeah. Uh, then I made a, a big mistake. Uh, there was an exercise that I'd learned uh, from a group in New York called Vampire. And in Vampire, uh, what you do is you all walk around with your eyes closed like this until you feel some hands around your neck. And, and I would start it off and put my hands around the neck, and then I would also walk around. Uh, and and you felt the hands around your neck. You had to let out a huge blood-curdling scream when you turned into a vampire. And then if, when you're a vampire and your eyes are still closed, if somebody else's hands came around your neck, then you let out a huge sigh mm -hmm. and uh, became a human being again. Yeah. Um, and it's a wonderful exercise. It's a lot of fun. And so I was walking around with my eyes closed, being a vampire, and I wasn't hearing any screams. 
uh, or size. And I opened my eyes, and uh, there was one other person walking around with her eyes closed. And uh, 30 women had left the room. Uh, 28 were sitting down there just watching. <laughs> and um, All this in a matter of minutes. Yes, this is all, all, all very quick. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I figured something had gone wrong, yeah. but I gathered with yeah. the 30 women who were left, and I said, uh, we're going to come here every week yeah. uh, from now on, and we're going to create plays. And uh, 21 years later, we're still working with that group, and we're still creating plays. So it was, a, it was a commitment that we kept. And afterwards, some of them came up to me and, and said, can we scream every time? Because you're not allowed to scream in prison. And so they felt this is something they'd be able to do. And in retrospect, I've also realized that a lot of them must have been remembering uh, experiences of, of abuse and assault and what they'd gone through domestically. And I, I didn't know that at the time. But later, I learned that, of course, that's, I think it's 60 to 70 percent of incarcerated women have been through really traumatic experiences. So which is why when you told them they could scream, they couldn't handle it, and they left. Yes. Yes, I think that's true. So you went there thinking this is an extension of your classroom. You didn't go there to serve a prison, it sounds like you said. No. This is a classroom, two more students. Right. And then it turned out it became a, an arts project. Instead of two, 58 showed up. And then 21 years later, several thousand have gone through this particular program. Right. A and I, I, I think the reason I, I grabbed it yeah. uh, was uh, that it was something I, I wanted. It, it was not merely an extension of the classroom and two more students. It was that um, my experiences in the past as an activist, being involved in the anti-war movement, and a whole range of things made me know that this was something I wanted uh -huh. to do. And I, I didn't know at that time about where that, that we were putting people who we were not employing uh, in the prisons. That's where we were keeping them. There had been a vast increase of prisons in the United States at that time. And I didn't know that. W once I learned it, uh, I knew that I had to go there with whatever meager talents I, I had, you know, as an, as an actor. I didn't have much experience as an actor. I'd never been trained professionally. But I knew I could bring something there. And then eventually it, it developed into bringing all of the arts uh, to the prisons because that's what I could offer. That's what I was able to bring. So you've gone beyond theater to other forms like painting and music and poetry. And what else have you experimented? Uh, well, we've, we've had dance uh, for a while. We've had some music workshops. We, we work in juvenile facilities and, and high schools in Detroit as well, and in, in high schools that are challenged, in poor high schools. We don't go to the elite high schools. Uh, so we've done uh, video. We've done photography, neither of which we can do in the prisons. Um, dance. We've, uh, we've, uh, we've created over the 21 years now uh, uh, it's over 532 original plays in, in all those facilities. Okay. Uh, we've done about 200 readings, public readings, within the prisons and the okay. juvenile facilities and high schools and so on. We've had about 134 art workshops and so on. So it's, uh, it's pretty mammoth uh, what we've achieved. And can you give me a sense of the scale of the program? How many prisons, how many prisoners have gone through it, and how many people are involved clearly it can be just yourself and I understand your wife is also very actively involved right uh, yes I, I, Janie uh, moved out to Ann Arbor in, uh, in 1994 and uh, yes 1994 and I immediately uh, tricked her into going in to show her art in, in, in a prison and she got hooked and so she started doing an art workshop and then she and I are, are, were initiated the annual exhibition of art by, yeah. by Michigan uh, Michigan prisoners at that time. Uh, probably, it's hard to estimate at this time, but we know that well over, well, probably 1,500 artists at one point or another have been in the annual exhibition, uh, prison, prison artists, uh -huh. um, and many, many more. We prob I'd probably say that maybe a total of, it's a wild estimate, maybe 3,000 prisoners have gone through our workshops and gone through the art show and so on, and uh, probably... Over a thousand students have directly uh, participated, either through working on the art show and traveling to the prisons to select art, uh, or in, in doing the workshops over the years. So I find that aspect a little fascinating in the way our society is organized, or at least thinks of itself. A place like the University of Michigan graduates some of the most elite uh, intellectual group of 
students that you can think of, mm -hmm. and a prison is considered like people who just float to the bottom of our social system end up. Right. And you're bringing these two worlds and make them function together. Uh -huh. And what is that experiment like? Well, it's also the University of Michigan, the income level of parents is uh, very, very, very high. I don't remember the exact percentage, so I have it in the book. Uh, but I think maybe 20% of the parents of uh, University of Michigan students make over 250000 a year. You know, it's, it's a very elite university uh -huh. in, in that sense. It's yeah. not that there aren't scholarships for working class students and, and so on, but that's the overall income level. So, my, so basically my students, though not all of them, uh, come from the suburbs and from very wealthy backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of them are white and uh, most of them are female because males don't tend to move towards this kind of work, towards social work or, or things like that. So we get out of a class of 24, I might have five uh, male uh, students. Interesting. And, uh, and, and we have some students who are working class, some students who are African American or Hispanic or so on. But by and large, it's a, it's a white elite uh, group of students from wealthy backgrounds. They have to interview to take the courses. Um, and I am pretty harsh. I tell them what kind of pain they're going to run into, what I expect of them, what kind of how they're going to have to obey the rules when they go into the prisons and so on. Um, and most of them then send me an email saying, I want, to, I want to do it. So I think what happens is, and why it works so well, is when we go into a prison to do a theater workshop, for example, or a poetry workshop, uh, we're going in to create something. Mm -hmm. And everybody walks into the room. We walk into the room. The uh, prisoners walk into the room. Uh, and therefore, there's a creative space that wouldn't exist if we hadn't decided to come there and if it, we hadn't been approved to come there. And then all we do is, is we, um, we come in. We're good at focusing things. We're good at negotiating with the liaison to make sure we can come in and that everything is in order. Uh, we bring in a few exercises at the beginning, theater exercises and so on. My students have not studied incarcerated people before they come into the workshop because the incarcerated people cannot study elite uh, students. So we want them to go in together and, and meet. Uh, the prisoners often are concerned that they will be judged uh, as criminals and as terrible people. Mm -hmm. And the students are concerned that they will be judged as, as uh, elite, rich people who have no street smarts. So everybody comes in like, where am I? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to me? Everyone is a bit insecure in this Everyone's in insecure. And, and they get past that very quickly because we do the, the theater exercises, for yeah. instance. We spend the first two sessions getting wacky, running around, doing crazy stuff. Poetry, we have fun exercises to start. Uh, and, and basically what happens, because you're creating poems together, and you, you're getting up to read the poems in front of each other, and my students write their own poems and so on. We act in the plays. Um, the, what happens is, is that we have a task. And I think this is, a, this is the basic thing for any community group, is mm -hmm. not to come in and lecture to people or give them lessons or yeah. come in from above and be their teachers and so on, but enter into the space, be vulnerable, take risks, uh, whatever risks you're able to take and whatever your vulnerability is, but, but have the courage to, to write or to act or, or take on new roles and so on. Uh, and because of that task, the boundaries which are st still there, I mean, yeah. we, we know we're white, we know that most of them are African American, and Hispanic and poor white and so on. Uh, the gender differences are, are huge. The class differences are huge. But, and they're all still there, but in, in a certain sense, they go away because we're creating together and we're going to get up in front of people together and we're going to perform on a stage or in a room together. And it creates just a wonderful atmosphere to the point at which in the best groups, which is most of them, at the very end when we're leaving, uh, everybody says this has been a family, mm. which is very, very difficult to achieve in prison. There, there's, there's one prisoner, uh, a, a guy named Hollis L., and I've quoted him in, in the book, yeah. who, who said, um, he said, when I'm in the yard, I'm like this, which means he's keeping up a front, he's, he's tough and so on. He says, when I come into the workshop, 
I'm like this. Mm -hmm. And when I go back into the yard, I'm like this. So it's a space where there's some potential. Uh, prisoners don't often think of each other as friends, but it's a, a chance where you can say some things. We try to create spaces where, uh, where nothing leaves the room. So you take a risk or you write a poem or something or you, you say something that nobody knows. We don't talk about it. They don't talk about it in, in the yard. So it's an opportunity uh, for them. And it's opportunity for my students to get past their stereotypes, the cliches that they've been given in yeah. their lives and so on, and really interact with people who are as powerful and as interesting and as complex as they are. So I'm curious about what sort of you mentioned this particular person. At least there's a, some amount of transformation when he comes to the thing and mm -hmm. then he says he returns back to his normal life. Right. But over a period of time, I'm assuming part of the goal is to affect some sort of inner change, inner transformation. And what have you seen among the people who participate in it? Because it's a voluntary program. Not every single prisoner comes into this right. arts project. Yeah, my assumption is that when uh, Halasel goes back into the yard yeah. um, and he's had this inside of him, that's also back in the yard with him. And it's a, it's a reserve and it's an influence. I, I was at San Francisco um, jail th this morning uh, uh, talking about the work I do. Yeah. Uh, and they're also doing theater. They're doing plays. They're doing poetry. Yeah. And after I read a section uh, from the book about what the artists get from the show, um, and, it, and some, there's some very hard statements in there. There's somebody who wrote a poem about his childhood and how he'd been abused and, and how the art show made all the difference for him. One of the young men there uh, began to speak, and he, and he said, that was me. He said, when I came in, I, was, I had been abused, I'd been hurt, my whole family was like that. Um, I was hard, uh, I was cold. When I came in, I just wanted to draw skulls, you know, and, and all the roles that I tried to create in, in the play were, were tough roles. And then he talked about how gradually writing poetry, yeah. uh, acting in the plays, uh, had led him to a very, very different uh, place. And it, it, was, uh, it, it was just great testimony as to what can happen when you do this work. And, and I'm telling you that story because I just heard it this morning. Yeah. Uh, but it's about what happens for a, a lot of people. Uh, we also, you know, some people will say to us, well, you should be, why don't you work with the children in, in Detroit? You know, why aren't you, why aren't you doing that? That's yeah. where it all starts. And one of the answers you can give to that is that we're working with the parents. And most of the parents are going home. Yeah. And if the parents have grown, they've worked collaboratively with others to create a play, um, if they have a new sense of the popular word is self-esteem, if they have new resources because they've done this, they're going to be good parents. Or they're going to have a chance to be good parents, depending on the challenges they have outside. So I think we're working with the children in that sense. I see. Now, I know you make a reference in the book, but for our viewers, why did you decide to call the book, Is William Martinez Not Her Brother? Who is William Martinez? Uh, William Martinez uh, grew up in Oakland. And uh, he ended up, uh, I don't, I tried to find out as much about him as I could, okay. and some uh, lawyer friends here did a little research. Uh, and he ended up belonging to a gang, a gang called uh, Nuestra Familia. Uh, and he then ended up in a, the security housing u unit at Corcoran Prison. Mm -hmm. And at that prison, the uh, corrections officers uh, were setting people up to fight in, in this yard. Uh, and uh, they were betting on who would win the fight. So it's like a recreation thing. It was a recreation thing for them. And they were actually betting. And it was in a, in a recreation yard. And, uh, and once the fight started, they would uh, shout, uh, shout uh, a warning and saying, stop fighting. If they didn't stop fighting, then they would uh, fire these, I think they were wooden pellets, which would sort of, and everybody would get down. If the fighters didn't get down, then they would, uh, they would shoot, I forget the name of the weapon, but it was a, a, a rifle, and it had a bullet that would explode inside of you, and they would shoot to kill or to wound. And, uh, and William Martinez came into the yard one day, and they had set him up, as I understand it, to fight with a man named Pedro Gomelli, who was from, from La Emme which was a gang in Los Angeles. And there was uh, tremendous enmity between those, those two gangs, uh, rivalry and so on. And if you were from Nuestra Familia and somebody from Miami wanted to fight, you had to fight, because otherwise you would disgrace your particular gang. 
And so they set them up, and, um, and uh, Martinez had won the fight, and uh, he was walking away from the fight, and the, uh, the rifle hit him in the back and, and killed him. Uh, and I'm not sure why they decided to do that, but the fight was clearly over, and that was, uh, and I've, I've seen the film, and California Prison Focus made the film, because they, the, they had the video, yeah. they got in the video, and they broke it down so that you could follow each step of the fight, and you could see that when he was walking away, uh, that he was shot in the back. And, and so the, the, the question of the book, and, and I, I mean it to be a really honest question, is, is William Martinez not our brother? And Robert Moses came to the university um, oh, four or five years ago, and he said the problem with America is that we do not think of other people's children as our own. And so in my class, uh, that term, when we saw the film uh, from Corcoran, uh, 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 my student said, began to say, is William Martinez yeah. our brother? And, and I think, generally speaking, most Americans don't think William Martinez is their brother uh, or their son or their child and so on. Because essentially, as a, as a nation, we disregard them. They're invisible. We consider them trash. They've created a crime and so on. Uh, but it's an old question. And it's an important question. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, what is our responsibility yeah. to others? And so I raise that. And in the book, I talk about my relation to Nate Jones, uh, who is somebody I knew for, for many years. He was, grew up in East Detroit, a very, very tough guy, terrible experiences. A couple white guys, when he was in the Army, tried to stab out his eyes and so on. Um, and he managed to get himself together, came to the University of Michigan, uh, worked in some of the workshops that I have. He entered school social work and so on. And so he and I had a long relationship and a long friendship. He once mm -hmm. called me his best friend. And yet I'm aware of ways in which I was unable to be his friend. And so for me, it's a really hard question. Uh, there were circumstances of his that I couldn't understand or get into. There were times that he disappeared. There were times he called upon me and I tried to respond, but I didn't always respond as fully as I needed to. So I'm aware it's a very difficult question. And I spent time with him, him when he was, he was dying. I saw him every week and yeah. we became very close. But um, it, it's a really honest question. Nice. Yeah. Now, have you had situations where you had some of your students who've done this work actually end up on the other side? inside the prison or one of the prisoners finally coming out and ending up being a student and going back to the prison where the roles were actually reversed? We were afraid that Nate Jones would, would end up going back to prison, but he didn't. He went back after he got his social work degree into some fairly heavy things and we were scared for him, uh, but he didn't go back. Uh, I've only had one student uh, who has uh, ended up in prison and he was not, he wasn't in the Prison Creative Arts Project, but he, he took a class. And um, he lived in Ypsilanti. He was from a working class family. He's African American. And uh, I read in the paper that he'd uh, committed an armed robbery. And uh, he was able to convince the judge that uh, God had told him to do this. And so uh, I don't know whether he was acting or whether this was something he really had experienced. Uh, so he was assigned to a psychiatric ward, but w was in prison. That's the only one of my students who's, who's gone back, but many of my students have uh, gone on to work in prisons uh, professionally uh, and worked with prison groups and, and so on. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, at some level, um, are you really encouraging and teaching and making people understand compassion? I mean, just going by the title of your book itself, mm -hmm. and is just the fact that you're bringing art into the prison just the uh, surface level, but there's something deeper going on here in, wor in what your real mission and purpose is and what has been driving you for 21 years to do this. <laughs> uh, it's, well, I mean, it's on several levels. Uh, the one, is, one is that I, I realized, as I said early on, that this is where we were putting everybody. Uh, and then I had to figure out what it meant for, for me to go in and, and do this. And I see the work we're doing as political work. Uh, when we do this massive uh, exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners, 
and uh, we had 422 pieces of art on the walls in, in, the, in the last show. It's the biggest prison art show anywhere in the world. Uh, and what happens is that people walk into the gallery and they see very, very powerful and, and very, very skillful work. Uh, I mean, the, the, some of the artists could exhibit anywhere on the outside. Uh, and they see a whole variety of colorful work, uh, of landscapes and family portraits and abstract work and some prison scenes work and work about the economy and so on. Uh, and I've heard people say in the gallery, this is, this is magic. And they'll say, I had no idea, because their stereotypes of prisoners are uh, punitive. Uh, they see them as trash or as, uh, as criminals. Uh, they don't see them as creative people. They don't see them as people who have ties to their families or who love their children and so on. And, and they walk in and they see portrait of, portraits of people's children, of artists' children. And, and so what happens is that, and, and I think we've had an effect in Michigan, is that people suddenly change their understanding. They get a more complex sense of who the prisoners are. Mm -hmm. And we accompany that with events. And so we have people, uh, former prisoners, and also people in mental health and other fields who come and speak. So the whole prison system and the reasons for it and so on get get much more complex. And also my students, you know, who go in, nobody would have sent them into a, a prison if, mm -hmm. if we weren't doing this. And they get to go to a place where they suddenly understand the complexity, the humanity, the power, the talent of people. And they don't keep it to themselves. They go home for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. uh, and they tell their parents, they come back to their dorm room and they tell their roommates. And sometimes their roommates treat them badly because they're doing this work. And sometimes, sometimes their family members are angry at them because they're doing this. But they stand up and they talk about it. And they tell personal stories of particular prisoners and so on. Yeah. And people begin to adjust and, and think about this. And, and it doesn't, it changes some things or it changes perceptions. It's not the larger political work that needs to be done to stop mass incarceration in this country. But it's a piece of it. I see. Yeah. And you refer to mass incarceration. And uh, that brings up like a disturbing statistic, of one that I'm not particularly proud of now, but should be, is why does this country have the largest prison population in the world? Is it the largest or one of the largest? It's, uh, yes, it, it's the, uh, it is the largest now. And uh, we are actually 25% of all prisoners in the world. We're 6% we're of the world population, and we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Something wrong or deeply disturbing yeah. that uh, we're not paying attention to what's going on here. And, and the fact that we don't pay attention to it is, yeah. is very, very significant. Uh, well, the history, and I, I write about this in one chapter, and I draw very much on a book by Mark Maurer called Race to Incarcerate and a book by Christian uh, Parenti uh, called Lockdown America. So I'm, when I give this analysis, it's really their analysis, which I elaborate on. Uh, what happened was that uh, in the early years of the Reagan administration, according to Parenti, there was a, they decided to induce an artificial uh, recession. Uh, and they were doing this because working people had, had made many, many gains. And, and uh, working people had, including, they had, they had gained uh, access to self, uh, safety rules and, in, and environmental health rules in all their plants and so on. And it was costing companies a lot of money yeah. to pay for all of this. So with Reagan, you, one of the first things you had was the uh, concessions movement. He asked... Uh, companies to give, uh, uh, workers to give concessions and give up part of their s uh, salary. And then this mass, uh, this massive recession, I remember in Ann Arbor, was suddenly we were... I think uh, I might have to just wrap this up so probably like, you know, we're at the bottom of the hour. So. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> uh, well, very quickly then, uh, so all these people were put in the streets and we began building prisons at that time. Uh, at one point there was a prison a week being built in this country. And, uh, and then we be began to create very long sentences so people would stay in prison a long time. And essentially, people were being taken out of the economy. And by the time they got out of prison, they couldn't be in the economy anyhow. So it seems like a, a policy decision gone very bad that we still 
kind of dealing with the repercussions of that. Yes, and we okay. still don't have decent salaries decent salary. for human beings. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Buzz. It is a pleasure having you on the show. You're doing this is some amazing work you're doing, and clearly, 21 years if you've gone through it, it is straight from the heart. So, uh, again, uh, our guest today is Buzz Alexander, professor of English literature at the University of Michigan, founder of the Creative Arts Project, and uh, the author of the book is William Martinez, not our brother. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank having you. you on the show. Enjoyed it. So at this point, I think we're probably off the set. Okay. Yeah.